thank you for um, inviting me into the space of um, connection, of presence, and of global movement building that I feel is happening uh, all around us. And what I would like to add to the conversation we are having here is um, to focus on the question how to, what does it take to apply the power of mindfulness not only onto the cultivation of the individual, but also onto the um, transformation and cultivation of the collective, of the larger systems, of the social fields that we collectively enact? So that's the question I would like to address. And um, like probably many here in the room across the planet, uh, many people feel that we live in a moment of disruption where something is ending and dying and something else is wanting to be born. And um, what's ending and dying has to do with an old mindset of maximum me, of bigger is better, of special interest group, driven decision-making that in many fields, in many systems, had led us into a state of organized irresponsibility. What's wanted to be born is less clear, but it has to do with connecting to the deeper level of who we really are and the deeper level of our own humanity and acting from there, not only as individuals, but also as collective entities. I would like to start our conversation with um, showing a little map that um, uh, maps the landscape of the current transformation that we all are part of. It's probably a model you have seen a hundred times. It's like the iceberg model and the main idea being 10% of reality is visible above the waterline and then there are these other 90. And when we look, you know, when you go around, you, you know, visit countries and communities, what do you see? All over the place, countries, any kind of society is dealing with three major issues, which is the ecological divide, the social divide, and the spiritual divide. And the uh, ecological divide manifests in many forms of environmental destruction. And um, Eileen Fisher this morning was mentioning the number 1.5, that we collectively use 1.5 planets you know, 1.5 times the regeneration capacity of uh, planet Earth. That's kind of the, um, uh, the first divide. And the social divide also manifests in many different forms that we are familiar with, poverty, inequity, um, social polarization, basically the breaking apart of our social fabric that we can watch happening around us. And uh, while the ecological divide is arising from a disconnect between self and nature, and the social divide is arising from a disconnect between self and other, the spiritual divide really is arising from a disconnect between self and self. The disconnect between who I am today and who I could be tomorrow. And if that, if these two selves are not connected with each other, what do we feel? We feel loss of energy, we feel symptoms of burnout, of depression, maybe even at risk uh, for suicide. 2010, more people killed themselves, died through suicide, than were killed by murder, war, and natural disasters combined. So in spite of all the violence going on in the world, more people kill themselves than are being killed uh, through others. So what? none of this is new. What have we learned in dealing with these issues? It's just getting worse. These divides are deepening. We learned what, what we did, what we responded to, uh, how we responded as societies to these issues is that we basically created one or several ministries for each of these clusters, single focus NGOs on the environment and all these social issues and so on and so forth, um, academic departments, conferences, journals, funding programs for each of these issues. So basically we have a little industry around each of these uh, symptom clusters 
And what's happening, what's not happening, or what's happening too little is to address the question, what is it that makes us reenacting results that no one wants? In most systems today, we collectively create results that no one wants. Why? What is it that makes us? And that's the question of these 90%. And I want to uh, briefly uh, address um, some of these. Now, if you explore the deeper structural factors, there's a whole set of systemic disconnects that I'm not going into today because I have done so in others, but it deals with the disconnect between the financial and the real economy. And uh, by the way, I see taking, uh, people taking pictures. You can download this presentation from my homepage. So you see there also, there's like, um, all these issues are familiar with you, and yet they are not the root issues. So these systemic disconnects need to be like the disconnect between GDP and GNH. GDP, kind of more consumption, more production of goods and services, and our well-being, our happiness. In developed countries, more GDP does not translate into more well-being. So those are, you know, uh, and there are like seven or eight of those. Now, what is the deeper root issue that makes us reenacting all these systemic disconnects and that makes us you know, reenacting the deepening of these three divides that we see going on around us and that we participate in. And I believe that the, probably the most important root issue that for all of this, all of the above, originates right between our ears. It originates in the quality of our thinking in the outdated paradigms of economic thought that are vastly out of touch with the realities of the century. This is exactly where the moment where I usually tend to lose my audience. Mindfulness, economics, kind of economic theory, and yet I want to ask you to, at least for three more minutes, stay with me, and in these three minutes I will take you through 300 years of history of economic thought and history of the economy. What is the modern economy? The modern economy is based on division of labor as the key for productivity. And it comes with the question, how do we stitch together the whole? How do we kind of reconnect the whole? And in the history of the economy and history of economic thought, we have seen three answers to that problem. The first one being centralized control, right? which gave rise to central planning, to state-centric economies like mercantilism or socialism. This is great because in a time of instability and insecurity, this can create kind of, uh, you know, stability, security, and focus on investment in infrastructure. And it's bad because it's lacking dynamism. It's lacking kind of entrepreneurship which leads us to the second solution, which is a decentralized coordination mechanism, market and competition, which gave rise to the private sector, rise to the power of entrepreneurship, leading to generating huge amounts of wealth and also huge amounts of problems in the form of inequity, poverty, and environmental destruction, which then leads us to the 3.0, to the third chapter of this story, which is the birth of the social sector, the, the, you know, basically people organizing around all these negative externalities and creating kind of influence groups to evolve the regulatory framework and evolve the policies in a way that is dealing better with these negative externalities, giving rise to institutional innovations like social security, the Federal Reserve System, and environmental standards. So that system, the 3.0 economy, served many people throughout the 20th century. But at the beginning of this century, this model is hitting the wall because we cannot deal with the global externalities that we face today. And I believe the crisis of our moment, the crisis at the beginning of this century, has begun with um, a transition to a possible 4.0 economy in which the three sectors that in the 3.0 economy kind of 
the three sectors being business, government, civil society, that tend to conflict and fight with each other, kind of in the 3.0 economy, in which these three sectors begin to co-create with each other in order to innovate at the scale of the whole system, activating a fourth coordination mechanism, which is shared awareness, which means seeing and acting from the whole. So what I have been telling you is that the history of the economy and the history of economic thought can be seen as an embodiment of an evolving human consciousness that moves from traditional forms of awareness, like loyalty, fitting into traditional norms, to ego system awareness, which is what we still teach at business schools, like the one I'm uh, uh, teaching in, uh, to stakeholder awareness in the 3.0 economy, which is the real world, kind of in any kind of real business, in a real NGO organization, you need to manage the key stakeholder relationships. Kind of that's the real reality today. So what I believe is necessary today, ecosystem awareness, and what I mean with ecosystem awareness is it's an awareness that not only focuses on my well-being and that of my few key stakeholders around me, but the well-being of all stakeholders in the system and the whole, including the well-being of the planet. So in my experience, the number one leadership challenge today across all systems is the same. And it deals with moving complex stakeholder systems from one way of operating, which is based on their ego system awareness, which is basically looking at reality just from your own silo perspective, to another way of operating that's based on ecosystem awareness, which is focusing on the well-being of the whole, on the well-being of all. How do you take a stakeholder group? What does it take to move a stakeholder group from ego to ego? And what it takes in our, exper in our experience, kind of you know, what we saw in our experiments, is it takes a journey. A journey that moves them through the stages of observe, 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 allow the inner knowing to emerge, connect with your deeper sources of stillness, uh, to act in an instant. And that type of process only works when it is complemented by an inner leadership work that I first stumbled into when talking with the late CEO of Hanover Insurance, Bill O'Brien, who claimed that the success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. What does that mean? So he says, the success of what I do as a change maker depends on the inner place from that I operate, the quality of attention and intention that I bring into a situation. And if we map this place, kind of the territory of that inner place, I think it has to do with the opening of the mind, the opening of the heart, and the opening of the will. And what I mean with open mind is the capacity to suspend our old habits of judgment. What I mean with open heart is the capacity of look at a situation through the eyes of another, through the eyes of another stakeholder. And what I mean with um, open will is the capacity to let go and let come. I want to show you an example where uh, a leader is going through that shift and where a shift, where through that a shift is happening in the social field. And, um, it has to do with deepening um, our level of listening from, you know, downloading, just projecting what we already know, to uh, opening the mind, which is seeing something new out there, opening the heart, kind of accessing our empathy and beginning to sense a situation through the eyes of another, uh, to uh, the open will, which is really about letting go and letting come, connecting with that what is wanting to emerge in this situation. And um, so this evolution, if this is kind of the boundary of my system, let's say kind of the cognitive boundary I'm operating from, then the movement, the journey from one to four is, level one is I'm listening from the center of my own prison, right? All the windows are closed, all the curtains are down, I'm just projecting. 
Level two is I go to the window, I look outside and see something new. Level three, empathy is that my listening begins to happen from the place from where the other is operating from. And level four is really kind of um, becoming a holding space kind of for something new that is wanting to land, that is wanting to uh, emerge. So I want to show you uh, a quick example where it, uh, you see that shift with your own eyes in a two and a half minute clip. And then um, uh, we are going to uh, debrief that a little bit. So what you see here is um, uh, a conductor in the center down, uh, Zubin Mater, one of the greatest conductors of our time. To his left, you may recognize Placido Domingo, kind of the, um, the tenor, kind of one of the greatest tenors of our time. Behind them, a huge orchestra that's actually composed of two different orchestras. And if you, as you watch this clip, put yourself a little bit into the shoes of the conductor. He has the superstar on the, on the one side, kind of somebody who is more equal than anyone else. And then this huge orchestra and a huge audience. Uh, and all these forces are pulling him into different directions. His job is to connect to the whole field and to bring everything together into a moment of peak performance. No puede ser que salve la escuela No puede ser una mujer almada En su mirar como una luz singular He visto esa mujer que es una desventura No puede ser una vulgar sirena Envenenó las horas de mi vida. No puede ser porque la vi rezar, porque la vi querer, porque la vi. just saw. Take a moment and listen to the resonance in your body and your heart. What was the shift that you noticed? You don't have um, 
the time to go into a detailed debrief here, but I have done that with many groups around the world. And what all of these groups point out is, number one, of course, the end is very different to the beginning. And as you begin to inquire into the shift, uh, we see kind of that the conductor is kind of beginning this way, and then uh, at some point, he is uh, turning around and giving all his attention to, uh, you know, the arms are open kind of, and you see all his attention to the solo singer, and you see the emotional connection uh, among them building up. So it's kind of moving kind of, so you see kind of this heart-to-heart -heart connection building up. And then shortly after that, we see this. He is dropping the baton. Now, as a conductor, I get my paycheck for doing this. And if I drop the baton, it means it's a radical statement. It says it's not about me in the center. It's about something else. And I am beginning to hold the space for something else. It's also not placido. It's that emerging moment of music that was just about to be born. And then, um, just before it happens, you see the baton going back up. And you, know, you begin to see how that emerging moment of music is beginning to land through placido. The baton goes up. And then, collectively, kind of they bring it into reality by bringing in the whole orchestra, kind of participating in the movement of uh, bringing that emerging mu uh, moment of music into reality. That way of operating is not factual observation. It's also not empathy. It is something uh, on a deeper level, connecting with the reality on a deeper level that turns ourselves into an instrument for bringing something that's about to emerge into reality the way it desires. And that uh, is what we call level four listening or presencing and what I believe has a particular role in the transformation of the larger systems uh, around us. So I want to share uh, uh, you, with you kind of the last 30 seconds again where you can see that. So the question is, how can we apply this way of operating to the task of the collect that I talked about uh, in the beginning? And the five cornerstones kind of that we kind of conceptually use uh, you know, from this example is number one, that's kind of the, um, uh, a little summary of the underlying framework here, structure follows consciousness. So the quality of my attention is creating the pathway how a conversation or how reality unfolds, as we just saw in the clip. Two, if that's the case, kind of if kind of the, the main task is to move beyond downloading old patterns, to do that in a social context, in the context of our social systems, we need to go through this process that I mentioned before, observe, observe, connecting to our deeper sources of knowing, and then um, the acting from the now, the prototyping. Three, for this process to work, we need to cultivate the opening of the mind, the heart, and the will. Four, as we go on that journey in real life, here's what happens. We meet the inner sources of resistance, the form of the voice of judgment, the voice of cynicism, and the voice of fear. And five, 
If we do that in the real world, we not only have to go through this open, opening process that we just saw as an individual, for example, by you know, transforming our way of listening from factual to empathic to generative, but also on a collective level, which means to transform the level of uh, conversation from downloading to debate to dialogue to collective creativity to transform the way we organize from centralized to decentralized to networked to ecosystem and to transform the larger system kind of that we operate in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from the 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 to a 4.0 economy uh, and society. In asking kind of change makers that we work with around the world, how do you operate now? Most people say this. Well, it's a, a blend between the first three levels. Kind of, that's what most, most of them say. And when you ask them, given the challenges that you face as a company, as a network, as an individual, what, is, what are these challenges uh, inviting you to do? And that's what they say. We need to learn to operate from level four. So how do you do that? And that's where we have done uh, 15 years of really action research, mostly going through these stages of co-initiating, co-sensing, uh, you know, uh, walking in each other's shoes, connecting to the deeper source of knowing, and then the prototyping. And what it really does to a system is this. It's turning the way how you relate to the system from this way, which is you know, seeing reality out there, the system is something out there, to this to seeing yourself as part of the system that you co-enact. So this procedure from here to here, if, if that's done by an individual, what do we call that? That's what we call mindfulness. It's paying attention to our attention. If we do that on a collective level, this procedure, what do we call it? It's called dialogue or systems thinking, which is helping a system to sense and see itself. And that's the central point of all these large systems transformations. That's kind of the strategic intervention, kind of that you try to be helpful to. So I'm going to uh, jump over these examples here. Kind of you create a container, you move through these sensing journeys kind of across the field. You make sense, kind of we develop new methods there with social presencing theater and so on. But the main point is, uh, and you know, they have been uh, applied in new organization, traditional one, this is kind of the biggest state-owned enterprise in China, or Alibaba, or the Global Wellbeing and GNH Lab that Eileen Fisher mentioned this morning. The point is, you can do that, many of you have been doing that, we have been doing that. The problem is this, it takes a lot of resources. And the unanswered question is, how does that ever go to scale? And that brings me to the last project I want to talk about very briefly, which uh, deals with the current disruption in education, which through the rise of MOOCs uh, sees a complete kind of disruption. And MOOCs have been an acronym for Massive Open Online Courses. They have been very popular and basically a part of a radical democratization of education worldwide and a problem because it's, you know, in the end, everyone is just sitting for their, uh, in front of their computer, kind of, it's flattening the learning experience. So in this experiment, we linked the power of MOOCs with mindfulness, local action learning, and activating the global field. So um, uh, let me uh, show a little clip about the invitation and then in the previous share video, the we talked about the increasingly disruptive challenges that we face as individuals, as organizations, and as societies. In this video, we'll talk about a concrete example of disruption, one that, by joining the ULAB, you will be helping to co-shape. I'm talking about the amazing moment of disruption that we are living through in higher education, not only here at MIT, but also around the world. I'm standing here in front of the main building of our MIT campus. It was built exactly 100 years ago. Over the past century, it gave birth to many significant innovations in society. When they built this campus, they had a very clear idea of ordering. At the top level, the library, abstract knowledge. Below that, math, then physics, 
then applied sciences. And in the basement, you had mining and metallurgy. We are now on the top level of the building, right under the dome. The library is still here. Some things, however, have changed. When you look around, you see most of the books have faded into the background, into the neighboring rooms. And today, most of the reading takes place right here at the computer screen. So technology has changed, but the old order is still in place. Wherever you are in the world, if you went to school, a setup like this probably will look familiar to you. The teacher up front talking, students sitting in neat rows listening. Education today is going through a moment of profound disruption. What's ending and dying is an old model of education that works through classrooms like this, through lecturing and listening. What's being born is a new model of education that works to learn by doing. Here are three principles that we believe will be at the core of the 21st century university and that we would like to prototype with you in this MOOC over the next few weeks. Number one, taking the learning from the classroom into the streets. Linking head and hand. MIT has always been a great place for linking head and hand. But over the past decade or so, we have seen major educational innovations that take students out of the classroom into the streets in order to engage with the real world. Look around. MIT is a really small place, just a few buildings, just a few people. And yet, the impact of this place and its community has been quite significant. For example, the combined revenue of companies founded by MIT graduates is surpassing $2 trillion. It would make it the 10th largest economy in the world. And it's an amazing example of the power of entrepreneurship, which really is the power of linking the head and the hand. What we believe is that the next evolutionary step of this power is to link the head and the hand with the intelligence of the heart. Most young people I know across cultures actually aspire to do the same thing. To use their entrepreneurship and their creativity in a way that's connected to their passion and in a way that makes the world a better place. So the second principle here is about linking the power of entrepreneurship with passion and with compassion, which is the intelligence of the heart. The third principle is about self-knowledge. What is self-knowledge? Self-knowledge essentially is an inquiry into the two root questions of creativity, which are, who is myself and what is my work? Who is myself means, what is my highest future possibility? What is my work means, what is the future that I want to be a part of in my journey forward? This transformation from the old university with abstract knowledge at the top and applied knowledge at the bottom to the new university with self-knowledge at its core also requires us to evolve the concept of science from only looking at external data to also exploring the more subtle aspects of our experience by bending the beam of scientific observation back onto the observing self. ULAB invites you on such a journey of reflection and renewal. So that was uh, the invitation. Um, 28,000 um, uh, showed up and um, then um, they, we were, so here are three learnings from that experience, which we are just wrapping up this week, a five-week learning experience. Number one, we were amazed by the power of creativity and self-organizing. The participants self-organized hubs in 350 places uh, across all cultures and countries, uh, in many countries. And um, 
formed 700 or 1,000 kind of deep um, listening-based coaching circles and went into this process with a way higher energy and openness than we would have ever expected. Number two, uh, so here are kind of a few pictures. Uh, Sichuan, China, uh, Mumbai, India, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Bay Area, uh, US here next door, the Impact Hub that we heard this great presentation this morning from. And uh, what we saw is that the, these people not only self-organized locally, but also started to self-organize and connect with each other kind of across the system and cultural uh, uh, boundaries. The second thing that we learned is when we asked them, how do you operate now? And they said, well, the first three levels and what do you really need to do the fourth level? We asked them, what's holding you back? With three words, tell us, why are you not operating on level four? Here's what people said. Ignorance, greed, and fear. When I shared that in the GNH lab with our people, from our colleagues from Bhutan, they said, you know what? These are the three poisons in Buddhism. Ignorance, greed, and fear. So what our global community came up with resonates deeply with the uh, kind of uh, wisdom in Buddhism. It basically says that the leadership, the essence of the leadership challenge today is to transform ignorance to inquiry, greed to compassion, and fear to courage. Uh, when we people ask about the impact, let me go over this uh, here. Um, we asked them last week, okay, after five weeks, um, you know, what was the impact uh, that you uh, had? And then 47% uh, said it was an eye-opening experience for them. Another 40% said it's a life-changing experience. So about 90%, 87% saying it was eye-opening or life-changing experience. An online course, think about that. How is that possible? And we believe it's possible because two things. The deep listening-based coaching service, where they use a process where either in place or remotely, within 70 minutes, have a level four field experience with each other. Um, and that's one. And the other one is this. Global moments, kind of guided global moments of meditation and mindfulness, there was experience kind of where the whole global community is coming together in live sessions in the same moment. And is going kind of through a meditative process of experience, the connection to the earth, to each other, and to the highest future potential. Which means that you, which led for many, many people to a very palpable experience of the social field, which functions as a gateway of connecting with your own deeper purpose. So that's basically what we learned, that you can organize, um, you can activate the social field, and that if you do that, you create a mechanism that blends education with global movement. So I started with the question, what does it take to address kind of the three divides of our time? And what I basically said, it takes a shift from the inner place from that we operate, from ego to eco, it takes, and to do that on a collective level requires us to make the system sense and see itself, to create kind of environments for that. And lastly, that enabled through the new technologies, we are now able to create entirely new global movement building mechanisms that put the learner into the driver's seat of profound social and societal renewal, and that wraps around that a, a learning environment that blends science, spirituality, and profound social change. And that creates an entirely new playing field for all of us. So we are... Um, we are uh, in the process of finding out kind of what are all these prototype initiatives that now emerge from all these hubs and these coaching circles. And we will be inviting, we'll be, so the people organized around regional boot camps, we will invite them 
uh, to MIT so that the prototyping, the graduates, kind of the people who, you know, you know, a prototype some of these initiatives then turn into the teacher for the next wave of ULAP participants will, which will be launching in uh, September so that it can be a self-reinforcing mechanism kind of where the global system begins to sense and teach kind of itself, each other. In August, so allow me to close with this little plug, uh, with the Mine and Life Institute, we'll launch um, a research initiative that is looking into the deeper dimension of what really happens when the social field is shifting. What is the role of consciousness in creating a deeper shift in the social field that we all know is so necessary? We all experience once in a while, but we can't really describe. And that will be, so there are like uh, 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 several of us from the Mind, of Life, Mind and Life Institute here, or go to their website, or simply send me an email, and we'll be happy to uh, uh, provide the um, information kind of for that launch conference that we will have in late August in Vermont. Thank you very much.